Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament. This is lesson number eight in that series for August 24 of 2024. It's in, entitled Teaching Disciples, Part Two. And it deals with the times when Jesus was teaching his disciples outside of Je Jewish or uh, Galilean territory. And we'll see how that works out. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping you, of reviewing your incredible experience in life here on this earth, as reported by Peter and Mark in this gospel. Guide and direct us, we may represent you correctly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In this lesson covering Mark 10, Jesus was approaching the end of his ministry on this earth. He had spent much time teaching these disciples as he re-entered Judean territory. The Pharisees argued with him again, trying to trap him on the subject of divorce. Mothers came with their children for Jesus to bless. A rich man observing Jesus blessing the children asked for the blessing of eternal life. And blind Bartimaeus cried out for Jesus' help as he left Jericho. <clears throat> Those all should be fairly familiar incidents, yes. So when weren't the Pharisees arguing with Jesus? <laughs> yeah. Was there ever a time? Not later in his experience, that's for sure. As we have noted previously in previous lessons, Mark 8, 22 to 26, through Mark 10, 46 to 52, are form a single section in the book of Mark. It focuses on Jesus' teaching of the disciples. In two instances, Jesus heals blind men. No doubt to those two men, it was a new life. Jesus went on to touch on other aspects of living the Christian life, marriage, divorce, children, how to relate to riches, and the rewards and costs of following Jesus. How often do we review our lives asking a question like these, considering the rewards and costs of discipleship? Among the Pharisees, there was constant squabbling, even between different groups of Pharisees. The Pharisees as a group considered themselves spiritually far superior to the rest of the Jews. Two groups of Pharisees, one more liberal and one more strict, constantly argued over the issue of divorce. They were hoping to embroil Jesus in a discussion of the issue. Jesus, of course, was too wise for that. Instead of a long discussion about the meaning of Moses' permission to divorce, Jesus took them back to Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24 and talked about the ideal marriage in the Garden of Eden, I might ask. It was impossible for them to argue against that point. So Jim, what does our Bible study guide tell us about all this? In this passage, the Pharisees asked Jesus if it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Among the Pharisees, divorce was considered lawful. The question was not, was on what grounds? The school of Shemai, or Shemami, Shemai, I guess it is, was arguably more restrictive only for childness, childness less, childlessness, there we go. Right. <laughs> Material neglect, emotional neglect, or marital unfaithfulness. The school of Hillel was much more lenient. Unfaithfulness. The Allowing door divorce for almost unreason. For almost any reason, though their process for granting the divorce was more complex, allowing to slow things down. Okay. Oh, slow things down. Excuse me, I'm sorry. These Pharisees had actually crossed the Jordan into the territory of Perea, which was under the control of Herod Antipas. Herod had divorced his wife and had married Herodias. We know about that. The wife of his brother, Philip. The Pharisees were hoping to get Jesus in trouble with Herod. Matthew 14, 1 to 12, tells a story about a Herod and the daughter of Herodias, which resulted in John the Baptist being beheaded. And that's not our main subject for today, but just a little bit of context. I'm fully convinced of two major reasons why God wants us to marry and have a family. One, we can learn a great deal about the problems which God has had with his children by dealing with our own children. This is a very important point. And two, if we get to heaven, 
we will have to learn to get along with thousands of people from different cultures and different time periods. Getting married and learning to get along with a spouse who does not think exactly as we do on all issues is an important preparation for that future life. Hmm, is that a fair consideration? What is our church doing, up, uh, doing about providing ways to strengthen marriages? Perhaps providing good quality premarital, premarital counseling is an important start. Getting together with other church members on a regular basis to eat together and talk about issues is a good second step. So now, coming back to the story of Jesus, turning to Jesus and the children, we have Mark 10, 13 to 16. Jennifer? Mark 10, verses 13 to 16. Some people brought children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples scolded the people. When Jesus noticed this, he was angry and said to his disciples, let the children come to me and do not stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms placed his hands on each of them and blessed them. And the good news I wonder how many children he blessed that day. Yes. Okay, Gordon? From the Bible study guide for Monday, while children were greatly desired in the ancient world, particularly boys in the male-dominated culture, birth and childhood were not easy. Without modern medical care, the risk to mothers in giving birth and to newborns, infants, and children were elevated. Many cultures had traditional medicines and amulets used to protect these vulnerable individuals against malevolent forces. Yeah. Well, how effective were those, huh? Not. While children were desired, they were of low social status along the lines of slaves. Actually, along we'll look the line at of slaves, actually, and that's from Galatians We'll look 4. at that a little bit later. In the Greco-Roman world, those who were deformed or undesirable would be exposed or even tossed in a river. Boys were valued over girls, but of course, sometimes <laughs> girl babies were left to die among the elements. Sometimes boys were too, I understand. At times, these abandoned babies were, quote, rescued, end quote, only to be raised and sold as slaves. Wow. From our Bible study guide. So one can get a taste of what childhood was like in biblical times from Galatians 4, 1 and 2. Myra? Verse uh, 1 from Galatians 4. But now to continue. The son who will receive his father's property is treated like a slave while he is young, even though he really owns everything. While he's young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until it's time, until the time is set by his father. Good News Bible. Okay, you want to go ahead and read Ellen White's there? From Mrs. White, she says, Jesus was er ever a lover of children. He accepted their childish sympathy and their open, unaffected love. In grateful praise of their pure lips was music to his ears and refreshed his spirit when oppressed by contact with crafty and hypocrit hypocritical men. Wherever the Savior went, the benignity, benignity of his countenance, what does benignity? That means how benign his countenance was. Okay. Um, yeah, I lost my And voice. some would say, what does that mean? Yeah. A countenance? The benign, benign countenance, so uh, yeah. uh, friendly, yeah. not yeah. not uh, not hostile. Yeah. No, okay, good. that's good. <laughs> and his gentle and kindly manner won the love and confidence of children. It's from Desire of Ages, page five eleven. Mm. On one occasion, Jesus had used a child to try to stop the disciples arguing about who would be greatest, but apparently they did not get the picture. Mark 9, 33 to 37, on this occasion, they came to Capernaum and after going indoors, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? But they would not answer him because on the road, they had been arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the 12 disciples and said to them, whoever wants to be first must place himself last of all and be the servant of all. 
Then he took a child and made him stand in front of them. He put his arms around him, uh, around him and said to them, whoever welcomes in my name, one of these children welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also the one who sent me. From the Bible study guide, they were wrong. Jesus is indignant. Throughout Mark, Jesus has some stri striking reactions to people, and it is instructive that one of his strong reactions was toward people who were keeping children away from him. Jennifer would agree with that, wouldn't you? Yes. Our pediatrician. Okay. What characteristic of children was Jesus pointing out that makes them appropriate citizens for heaven? Children who have good Christian parents learn to develop implicit trust in them. That would be a good preparation for their having implicit trust in God. However, could that make one more vulnerable to deceivers? <clears throat> the single most important characteristic a child is, is his or her capacity for growth in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Jim? Let not your unchristlike character misrepresent Jesus. Do not keep the little ones away from him by your coldness and harshness. Never give them cause to feel that heaven would, would not be a pleasant place to, the, to them if you were there. <laughs> Do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand or act as if they were not expected to accept. Christ, excuse me, accept Christ in their childhood. Do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom and that in coming to the Savior they must give up all that makes life joyful. Ellen oh, White, Ministry of Healing, page 43 and 44. Okay, so what can we do to better represent the kingdom of God to children with whom we associate? After Jesus had blessed the children, a rich young man who had been watching realized how much he would like to have that blessing for himself. Jennifer? From Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus was starting on his way again, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and your mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, you need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. Remember the ideas that the friends of Job believed and taught. If you are good, God will bless you and you will be rich. If you are bad, God will not bless you and you will be poor. So Jesus was asking the young man to give up all the evidence that he had, that he was a good and righteous man. Wow. Jesus looked round at his disciples and said to them, how hard it will be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words, but Jesus went on to say, my children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this, the disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, this is impossible for human beings, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up. Look, we have left everything and followed you. Yes, Jesus said to them. And I tell you that anyone who leaves home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will receive much more in this present age. He will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. How many brothers, sisters, and mothers can you have? <laughs> okay. And persecutions as well. And in the age to come, he will receive eternal life. 
but many who now are first will be last, and many who now are last will be first. From the Good News Bible. Okay, is that really possible in this life? <laughs> there has been arguments up, back and forth, up and down and so forth about what Jesus meant by this camel going through the eye of a needle. And um, there, one of the suggestions is there's a little gate that's open on Sabbath, a little tiny gate open on Sabbath uh, next to the main gates into Jerusalem. And some people said, well, if the camel gets down on his knees, he can sort of creep through this little gate and so forth. But there's no evidence that that little gate was ever called the eye of a needle. Contrary to that, there's a story in an apocryphal source that's very interesting because it has Peter going out and conducting evangelistic things in various places. And one place where, he's, where he goes to, there's a, a group of pro young women who are probably something like nuns there, and they're really trying to promote the work and so forth. And there's a rich man. And this question comes up, how can a rich man be saved? And the rich man goes to Peter and he says, okay, you see what it says, so if you want, I would like to be saved and I will give all of my goods and so forth to these young ladies who are doing a good work, etc. if you'll show me how the camel can go through an eye of a needle. And Peter prays a little short prayer. Now this is, remember, this is apocryphal. This is not in <laughs> part, of the, not part of the gospel. Peter shows, uh, prays a short prayer, Lord, you have trapped us by your words. That's Peter's little prayer. So then he says, okay, he sent some people out to find a needle. And he sent some other people out to, find a, a, to get a camel. And the rich man is a little worried about maybe something that's gonna work out here. So he gets a prostitute and a big slab of ham. And he puts the prostitute and the slab of ham on top of the camel. So then he says, okay, so the people come with the, the biggest needle they can find, with the big eye in it. But of course, it's still, you know, a little tiny thing. And Peter says, no, 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 no. That has to be a surgeon's needle. And it is technically a surgeon's needle. So they go back and they get this tiny little needle. And so the man gets his camel ready and he, they, they take the needle and they stick it in the ground. And as the camel approaches, the needle swells and swells and swells and swells and swells until the, the camel passes through, no problem. He turns around and goes back through, and then the needle goes back down. And the man says, yes, Peter, but you are the one who did the praying. I need to pray and see if I can get the camel to go through. Then I'll give my riches. So Peter says, okay. So the man starts praying and the camel starts up and the needle swells, gets about halfway through and it gets stuck. And then Peter says, oh dear, what am I going to do? And so forth. And anyway, anyway, finally it's, well, it opens up and that's true. And the guy gives his money. And so this is proof that the scriptures can be, be believed. <laughs> he reluctantly gave his money, huh? Yep. What did they have to do with the prostitute and the ham? He said that they put in... Well, he was, the, the rich guy was hoping that something would prevent the thing from happening. Yeah. Right. So it was... This is, these are Jews he's dealing with, and there's a prostitute on that camel. And so he's thinking yeah. of all the worst kind of things that could be. Things that couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly happen. happen. Mark is the only gospel writer who mentions that Jesus loved the young man. It is hard for us to understand exactly what it would be like to have Jesus' ability to look at each person and understand their full life story and character in dealing with them. Think of how many people he had to deal with. In the case of this young man, Jesus recognized the fault lines in his character. His riches were more important to him than a place in the kingdom of God. So Jesus' response to this young man was a shock to his disciples. Reading it again, Gordon? Mark 10, 27, Jesus looked straight at them and answered, this is impossible for human beings, but not for God. Everything is possible for God from the Good News Bible. Then Ellen White in Desire of Ages says, to those who, like the young ruler, are in high positions of trust and have great possessions, 
it may seem too great a sacrifice to give up all in order to follow Christ. But this is the rule of conduct for all who would become his disciples. Nothing short of obedience can be accepted. Self-surrender is the substance of the teachings of Christ. Often it is presented and joined in language that seems authoritative because there is no other way to save man than to cut away those things which, if entertained, will demoralize the whole being. Wow. <coughs> Well, has Jesus tried to tell us that nothing we can do could possibly earn salvation? It seems like Mark 10, 27 would have been a beautiful place to stop or to end this discussion. But then Peter blurted out that he and the other disciples had given up everything to follow Jesus and asked what they would receive. Well, notice these interesting comments from our Bible study guide. Myra? Yes. Here is the point. It is the death of Christ that involves human guilt, resolves. resolves human guilt. And then the grace of Christ and his resurrection are what empower obedience to his commands. Okay. So you all know immediately what that means, right? No. So how does the death of Christ resolve human guilt? Well, let's look at some possibilities. This seems to be based on the common and popular idea that Christ came primarily to die to pay the price for our sins. And that could possibly resolve human guilt. If somehow or other by magic, Christ's death takes care of our sins, then probably that would take care of our guilt. If one takes the larger Great Controversy Trust Healing model and understanding of the Great co Cosmic Conflict, then a different answer is necessary. If Christ is recognized as the one who died to prove the results of sin before the eyes of the entire universe, then as we realize that the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice, we can either one, choose to live lives as close as possible to his example and to live forever, or we will die, two, we will die the death that he died, separated from his father at Calvary. And that is the death that all sinners will ultimately die at the third coming. Ellen White says, commenting on this, Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was, pre was pressing upon his heart. So that sounds like something about dealing with guilt, right? The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. Well, that sounds pretty, pretty awful. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world that good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme, but now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, talking about guilt again, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. So what are we talking about? We're talking about guilt here and sin separating him Jesus from his father, right? The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. And think of what he had been through already. So what Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him as coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So those are some pretty fearsome words. Yeah. Those from Desire of Ages, page 753. Yeah. So if we understand the whole context, if we understand what he's trying to say, he's saying basically that guilt and sin separates a person from God. Isaiah 50, 
9 verse 2 just says, your sin separates you from God. So Jesus experienced that separation from his father and was, died as a result of sin. He's the only person in the history of our world so far that's died a direct result of sin. But it wasn't his sin, it was a no. collateral damage or... Yeah. or uh... yeah, no argument about that. We agree with that. And he, well, and in, to, to your point, he, he, he died that experience because he was trying to demonstrate to us how serious it is, how serious sin is. So how does the, his resurrection empower obedience to his commands? The fact that he rose on Sunday morning and ascended immediately to heaven is proof that he can do that for us. What an inspiration to follow his example. Jim? When the voice of the almighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, the Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now, excuse me, now, was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I may take it again. I have power to lay down, lay it down and have power to take it again. I have power to let. Now. Oh, now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John seven, let, excuse me, John 10, 17 and, and 18, two to 19. Over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed triumph. I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph to the humblest animate being, all are replenished by the, from the source of life. <clears throat> Only he who is one with God could say, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 758. So, 785, paragraph 2 and 3. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus has the power not only to raise somebody else, but to raise himself from the dead. And if the if Pharisees or the Sadducees were listening, they would have said, you and you, they didn't understand that they wouldn't get the satisfaction of killing him. <laughs> yeah. Christians are supposed to enter a new life, they experience new birth at the time of their baptisms. Paul extended the implication of that experience in Romans 6, 1 through 11. Jennifer? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Should we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to sin. How then can we go on living in it? For surely you know that when we were baptized into union with Christ Jesus, we were baptized into union with his death. By our baptism then, we were buried with him and shared his death in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might live a new life. For since we have become one with him in dying as he did, in the same way we shall be one with him by being raised to life as he was. And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross, in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed, so that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. For when people die, they are set free from the power of sin. Since we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that Christ has been raised from death and will never die again. Death will no longer rule over him. And so, because he died, sin has no power over him, and now he lives his life in fellowship with God. In the same way, you are to think of yourselves as dead, so far as sin is concerned but living in fellowship with God through Christ Jesus from the Good News Bible. Okay, that was a long passage. We've got several fairly lengthy passages in this lesson, but these are, these are important points in the Christian life. So have we learned how to think of ourselves as dead so far as sin is concerned? None of us are sinning anymore, right? 
Do we understand what it means to be living life and fellowship with God through Christ Jesus? Well, Paul apparently thought that's what we were supposed to do. Jesus and his disciples were on their way from Jericho to Jerusalem with a large crowd of people headed for the Passover. Many, if not all, of those people believed that when they got to Jerusalem, they would crown Jesus the King of the Jews. It was a time of excitement. But Jesus' disciples realized that Jesus had a lot of enemies in Jerusalem. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Jesus and his disciples were now on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going ahead of the disciples who were filled with alarm. The people who followed behind were afraid. Once again, Jesus took the 12, apostles, 12 disciples aside and spoke of the things that they were going to happen, that were going to happen to him. Listen, he told them, we are going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and then hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, whip him, and kill him. But three days later, he will rise to life. Good news, Bible. Wow. I mean, what would we, what, what did they think when they heard those words? I mean, clearly, Luke, who of course wrote much later, had an interesting comment about that experience. Luke 18, 34. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words were hidden from them. They did not know what Jesus was talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, why were the words hidden from them? They had a different paradigm. They, they just they were, they didn't were still fit. Looking for a they were so sure that Jesus was going up to Jerusalem to be crowned king. The idea that something less could happen to him. An earthly I mean, king. They knew. Yes. They knew how hostile the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. To, to, you know, to go through this, to kill Jesus? Couldn't imagine it. All the, what would happen to their position? Yeah. All of us apparently flew right over the heads of James and John and the other disciples. They were sure that Jesus was going to be crowned King of the Jews, and they wanted to affirm their positions on either side of Jesus in that new kingdom, and we've already talked about that. Once again, Jesus reaffirmed what he had said before that if someone wanted to be a leader in the Christian sense, he must be a servant to all, even a slave to all. And our Bible study guide adds, as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he reveals to his disciples what will happen there. It is not a scenario they believe or in or want to hear. Jesus' specificity as to the outline of his death and resurrection is striking. But when it is not what you want to hear, it is all too easy to dismiss. A Bible study guide for Wednesday, August 21. James and John were obviously trying to beat the rush ahead of their fellow disciples. They had already committed their lives to Jesus, so that in itself showed that they were not wholly selfish. Jesus asked them if they could go through the experiences that he would go through. They, of course, said that they could. But remember that they could not even stay awake one or two hours and pray with Jesus in Gethsemane. Do you think that they would have stayed awake and prayed if they had any real idea what was coming? Well, moving on with the story, where, as you recognize, I'm sure, out there, uh, this is a continuing story. We're just sort of following as the story through step by step. So Mark 15, 33 to 47, which we won't, read now in, his de in all of its detail, recount the death of Jesus and his burial. What do you think the Roman officer saw in Jesus that caused him to call him the Son of God? Any brilliant ideas? Now, you need to, we need to recognize that the Greek could be translated a son of the gods. It's not a whole lot different than Nebuchadnezzar, was it? Yeah, yeah, similar, similar. He knew, of that, he knew somebody. He wasn't. He was almost like otherworldly, for lack yeah. of a better way to express it. Well, and remember that this guy probably believed in a whole lot of gods. Yeah. So it, clearly, he he recognized that this wasn't an ordinary human being. So that's probably what's 
you know, if he's not a human, where, you know, what is he? Well, James and John in their request, of course, had no idea of any of this. Acts 12, verse 2 tells us what Herod, it tells us that Herod killed James, the apostle, by beheading. He was the first martyr among the disciples. John, of course, lived the longest of any of the disciples and went through the several threats on his life. Jim, I think you're next. John was cast into a cauldron of boil, boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the, the life of his faithful servant, even as he pre preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored to, in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am weak, sinful, excuse me, a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Let me interrupt for just a moment. You notice that he says, my, pa my master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. Clearly, John believed in the great controversy. He, wasn't just, he didn't think it was just the Romans or, or the Jews that were after Jesus. Okay, mm -hmm. go ahead. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. Then he was exiled to Patmos. Oh, if you right. can't, yeah, yeah, if you can't kill him, mm -hmm. kill him by throwing him to bot, Can pot of boiling. Can you imagine those men that pulled him out? You know, I you have to do it carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He probably waited until the boiling was finished, cooled off, then pulled him out. John was then exiled to Patmos, as we know, but later was somehow released from there and went back to Ephesus, which is probably where he died. And there's pretty good evidence that the reason John was released from Patmos was because a new opposing Caesar came to, to rule who said, okay, all those people who were, who were imprisoned or exiled by the former emperor, I don't agree with him, so I'm, I'm releasing all you guys. And all those who aren't in prison, you can go to prison, huh? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> Returning to the story on the road up to Jerusalem. Jennifer? From the Bible study guide. Jesus then calls the group together to give one of his most profound teachings. He indicates that Gentile rulers use power for personal advantage. But in the kingdom of God, power must always be used to uplift and bless others. Jesus leads the way as the king of the kingdom of God. How? By giving his own life as a ransom. Not quite what his followers expected to hear. Exactly. <laughs> From our Bible study guide. In the end, Jesus demonstrated the position of a true, humble Christian leader by washing the feet of the disciples in the upper room. Do you think God specifically prevented that? You know, the water was there and the towels were there and so forth, obviously brought by some slave, almost certainly a slave, at least a servant. And I'm sure that he and originally should have been there to wash the disciples' feet and Jesus' feet. Did God intentionally prevent him from coming back on time so Jesus would do that? <laughs> Maybe. Well, there, well, Mark mentioned one further event that took place on that trip from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem. Mark 10, 46 plus. They came to Jericho, and as Jesus was leaving with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, take pity on me. Many of the people scolded him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, take pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Get up, he is calling you. 
He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Teacher, the blind man answered, I want to see again. Mm. Go, Jesus told him, your faith has made you well. At once he was able to see and followed Jesus on the road. Now, obviously, I want to see again. So this is a man who has developed blindness for some reason. And now is able, going to be able to see again. So he uh, followed up to Jerusalem. Followed him up to Jerusalem, I presume. He, yeah. Through most of his ministry, Jesus had told those he healed to keep quiet about their healing and about him and who he was and is. And why was that? Because it wasn't time yet. They were oh. looking for the wrong Messiah. They were looking for someone to Another rescue person. them from the, from the Romans. Exactly. Become king to make them rulers of the world, to make the Jews rulers of yep. the world. Yeah. So Jesus says, I, I didn't come to do that. I don't fit that pattern. That's not for me. I have something far more important to do. So a few of them followed his instructions. During the last few months of his ministry, he was traveling mostly outside of Jewish territory, but many Jews and others were following him. As he approached Jerusalem, he was trying to attract as many people as possible that the, so that the events which were about to happen in Jerusalem would be known by thousands. Now, of course, you remember that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were hoping that they could arrest Jesus quietly and take care of him quietly so nobody would know. So what is Jesus doing? He's Getting sure. witnesses. He's saying that I want as many people around as possible so that everything that these characters do will be known and there won't be any question about what's going on. The Jews have been waiting for the Messiah's return for at least 400 years. And what, why do we say 400 years? It was since, since the times of uh, the end of the New T Old Testament writers. Malachi, who probably prophesied around 425 BC. And so that's more or less. 450 years before. Yeah. They expected the Messiah to take David's throne and help them conquer all their enemies. They quoted passages like Isaiah 11. I think we have time to look at just a couple of these. Um, specifically, I would look at Jeremiah 33, 15. At that time, I will choose a, as king a righteous descendant of David. That king will do what is right and just throughout the land. So isn't that a promise of God's future plans? And look at Zechariah 3, 8. Listen then, Joshua, you who are the high priest, who are the high priest, and listen, you fellow priests of his, you that are the sign of a good fu future, I will reveal my serpent who is called the branch. And then, of course, 6 verse 12, Zechariah 6 verse 12, tell him that the Lord Almighty says the man who is called the branch will flourish and where he is and rebuild the Lord's temple. And there's others. I mean, there's lots of passages there. So, I, I just a point of interest, that, I mean, not just a point, an important point of understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament in context. There's no evidence that anyone living in the Old Testament ever believed that the Messiah was going to come more than once. Now, we look at some of the passages in the Old Testament, we say, oh, but those passages reply to things that are going to happen further down the line. But there's no evidence that anybody in the Old Testament actually realized that. Then we come to the New Testament. What about God's prophets? Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, do you think they understood? Well, is there any they, evidence? They didn't write it. Okay, well, I mean, obviously, if they wrote something that they understood, but I mean, if they didn't write something that they understood, then of course we have no way of knowing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come to the New Testament and they, there's all kinds of, hundreds of passages that imply that Jesus is coming again. But it's not until the very end of Revelation in chapter 20 and 21 and 22 that talks about a millennium and Jesus coming a third time. So why do you suppose 
I mean, couldn't God have just spelled this all out back in the beginning and so everybody would understand? Why did God not tell people? Procrastination is an integral part of the way people function. <laughs> so you think if they knew in advance, they would just procrastinate, huh? If I know it's going to be a thousand years till the third coming, till the second coming, you know, I might act, might do things differently than I, than I hopefully will. And so, also, you know, life is uncertain. Things can happen. You accidents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Life is, can, can be very short. Well, in the Old Testament, we just pick a few passages here. They expected the Messiah to be a righteous descendant of David, the Lord our salvation, a king like my servant David. And those are just some of the, the more common expressions. Notice particularly Mark, my, Micah 5, verses 2 to 5. I'm just going to call that up here. The Lord says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you will, I will bring a ruler for Israel whose family line goes back to ancient times. How far did Jesus' family line go back? Yep. Prior Wasn't to there creation. A, bet, uh, a uh, Bethlehem up in uh, around Galilee? It was a, a Bethlehem up there. Oh, there could have been. Uh, Bethlehem means the house of the uh, house of the baker. Yeah, yeah. So there could have been more than one, yeah. But here, in the case of Jesus, so his family line goes back. If you call, it, if you want, you know. And I love that story. You'll forgive me repeating my, one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament. My, well, from the New Testament, as a black pastor in the South was telling about the time when Jesus, at age twelve, was talking to the. Uh, leaders at, in the temple in Jerusalem and his parents had gone on and they had to come back and find him and so forth. And in his version of the story, he says, well, after a while, they started asking him questions. And one of them said, son, how old are you? And he hesitated for a second. Well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Jesus didn't say that, but it wouldn't be a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to say. With the story about blind Bartimaeus, we close the discipleship section of the book of Mark. What do we mean by the discipleship section of the book of Mark? Remember? Where he's teaching the disciples. This is the time when he's set aside specifically to instruct his disciples. And a large part of that is instructing his, instructing his disciples about how to relate to Gentiles. Well, they didn't learn it very well. They, they got the message after he was gone. Perhaps Mark was trying to help us also to see the truth, just as those two blind men saw the world, maybe for the second time. What are we doing as a church to help children and young people stay connected to Christ and to realize that connection with Him is the only chance of living eternally? What would it mean to live a servant kind of life in 2024? Well, in Mark 10, verses 43 to 45, it says, This, however, is not the way it is among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be a servant to the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and give his life to redeem many people. Okay, now, I want to ask you how many, considering what we know from the book of Acts, did the disciples go out immediately and do this? No. No? <laughs> You're so sure about that, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. They were a close-knit society for many years. Yep. They had to stay in Loma Linda. And yes, and when you, if you look up there, remember that. Did I say Loma Linda? Yeah, you did. <laughs> had to stay in Jerusalem, I guess. Yes. Loma Linda, well, same thing. Remember that when the Jerusalem was destroyed, AD 70, 
the, the people who were left in Jerusalem escaped. Remember that, that there was uh, originally there, the, the Roman army surrounded there and then they left suddenly and went back. What, what happened was that uh, the guy who was leading the siege wanted to be the next Caesar. And so he said, I can't, and, and the previous Caesar died, so he raced back to Rome to find, and he, and he succeeded in becoming the next Caesar. But, and so the children, and so they, they fled Jerusalem and found a, a kind of small headquarters for Christians in a little place called Pella, which is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the Decapolis, in the Gentile territory. But even before that, quite a while before that, the, the, the city of Antioch, up in what was then Syria, is now uh, um, part of um, Turkey, became a sort of headquarters, and that was the that was the home church for Paul and Barnabas and Silas and others. And remember all that. Experience. And how did the gospels really get spread in the city of Antioch? Do you remember? Well, the people who went there at first were preaching the gospel truth only to Jews. And then some Christians who had recently been to what we today call Libya and others who came from the, the Muslim area of Cyprus came to Antioch and they were the first ones who started preaching the gospel to Gentiles. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so what does it actually mean to become a member of the kingdom of God? Mark illustrates that people who want to enter God's kingdom must possess the natural attitude of little children. God calls the rich as well as the poor to enter the kingdom of God. And three, to experience the kingdom of God now, we must keep certain principles in mind, as we have just been discussing. Let us be very clear, there is nothing we can do to earn salvation. God offers us salvation at no cost. But when we receive it and understand its implications for how we should live, it takes all that we can give. When parents give gifts to their little small children, the children accept them with excitement without asking anything about what they must do in repayment. Jennifer, you're the only one here who still has young children. Did Luke ever ask you, okay, what do I have to do to pay for this gift you gave me? <laughs> no, of course not. Do we accept the kingdom of God like that? Notice these interesting comments about the meaning of the, great, uh, the Greek word for, for receive. Myra? Oh. I think that's you. Is it Jim? Jim. Yeah. I'm sorry. The Bible, study. Bible study guide there, middle of the page. Comes from the Greek word dekomai, which means to take hold of something, to read, excuse me, to readily really? receive information and to regard it as true, to receive readily, to accept, to believe, to accept the presence of a person with friendliness, to welcome. Johannes P. Lowe and okay. Eugene Nida. That's a famous Greek, Engli Greek English lexicon, Loanida. Okay. In other words, Jesus tells his disciples, as well as the rest of the, his auditors, that if they want to do, enter the kingdom, they need to believe in the kingdom, they need to welcome the kingdom, and they need to take hold of the kingdom with enthusiasm of a little child when he or she takes hold of a gift. In short, we can enter the kingdom if we accept the good news about it. When we believe the good news, we make the kingdom ours, but from the Bible study guide. So we just said a couple of times in this lesson that we can't earn our, way, earn our, earn our salvation. Why is it that so many people seem, down through history, seem to have thought that that's what they had to do? Well, you know, using the word salvation and save, you know, it doesn't really give the, the, the I don't think, the correct picture because the word ha has to do with health and healing. Yes. Sin is a disease. That's correct. And forgiveness does not solve your problem. All that means is you've got a bunch of uh, forgiven or acquitted sinners 
they're likely to do the same thing because they haven't learned their lesson. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it was that Jesus said it would be so difficult for a rich man to enter heaven? It is so easy for the rich to think that their money can buy them anything they want. Unfortunately, many of the rich feel <clears throat> that their riches assure them a good life here. And, I mean, is that not generally too? If you're rich, why then you can pretty much get whatever you want. I found out there's a big fancy house. This was in the news today. A huge big fancy house that many people have been wanted, wanting. No neighbors nearby. It looks out over a wide expense. It's only $17 million. Well, they're not interested in giving that up for a life of service to others. Are we prepared to put God's kingdom first? What does that imply? That implies there must be a radical change in our priorities and perhaps even our paradigm. Reading again, Mark 10, 29 and 30. It, it, it wouldn't end it. Uh, you know, Jesus told you what to do to have eternal life. If, 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 if you somehow equate eternal life with, with uh, saving or healing mm -hmm. or so forth, well, the, the, the six or seven things that are listed in Mark, there's one uh, a little bit different. They use the term uh, don't cheat. But anyway, uh, or in Matthew uh, uh, 19, verses 18 and 19, you stop doing those things. Well, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, 27, you stop doing the bad things and you'll save yourself. Yeah. Alive. Well, yeah, and as Jesus said, the point is when you're baptized, you're supposed to put those things aside. You're supposed to not do oh, those I things. Know, one thing I forgot, and that is that what are the churches peddling? The law is nailed to the cross. Yeah. I mean, but, but what a bald-faced lie. I don't think you could, you could make it much worse than, than tell them that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin. That's another bald-faced lie. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, would you like to take on Mark 10 there? We just so what in summary should we learn from this lesson? Yeah, well, we, what we're looking here, we're looking at the life of Jesus. We're seeing the final events of his, uh, pro approaching the final events of his life. And Jesus faced this terrible thing, which he tried to explain to his disciples, and he did it for us. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for coming and living and dying to illustrate what, needs to, what we need to learn about Christianity, about the kind of lives that you want us to live when we rejoin you in heaven. May that day be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.